Hello and welcome to Essence of Wonder with Gadi Evron. My name is Karen Castelletti. I will be one of the hosts today along with my co-host, Ellen Bond. Uh, Ellen, if you would like to say hello. Thank hello, hello. You. Thank you everyone for joining us. We've got some amazing guests here to talk about the future of the Hugo, Astounding, and the Lodestar Awards. Yeah, we're, I'm really looking forward to this show. It's It's been uh, a long time in the working. Last year, we did a great series on on the, the Hugo Awards and got a lot of the finalists on. We're looking forward to doing that again this year. But uh, today, we're talking more about um, the the importance and, and the history and the context of the Hugo Awards. And uh, we've got some really great guests on to, to talk about that. Yes, uh, I, and I can and go ahead and introduce some of them. Uh, first, we have Vince, uh, Vince Doherty, uh, who uh, helped us with a lot of the panels last year and has been a key figure in the development and running of world cons for the whole of this century. Uh, he's often been found at the forefront of discussions regarding the awards and is always valued for his wise counsel. Um, Vince, thank you for, for joining us today. Next up, uh, we will have uh, Tammy Coxon, who is uh, a professional cocktail enthusiast and uh, the chief tasting officer at Tammy's Tastings. Uh, she's also a longtime contributor to Worldcon and has administered the Hugos before. Um, this is, she will, she'll be speaking with us a, a bit about the administration of the Hugos. And then last but not least, we have Nicholas White, who is a professor, diplomat, and uh, aspiring polyglot. Uh, when he's not doing those things, he likes to help with Worldcon when he can and has also administered the Hugos. So thank you. Thank you so much uh, to the three of you for, for joining us today. Um, I would like to, you know, get started actually by turning to you, Vince, uh, to talk with us about how the, you know, the history of the Hugos, how did they get started and uh, how have they developed? You know, is it good yeah, very, very happy to. Thanks, uh, and uh, Karen. And uh, I'll, I'll, I'll touch very briefly on the history of the World Cons it said, it, it themselves, because of course the Hugos are the gift of the World Con. Although sometimes the, the the noise, shall we say, around the Hugos can can overshadow the Worldcon itself. And I'll speak both from my experience, as you introduced, as a involved in the Hugos themselves, but also having chaired two of the World Cons, I, I've had a very hands-on experience of both elements of it. But, let, but let's go back. I mean, the Worldcon itself, the first World Science Fiction Convention was held in 1939 in New York. It was actually named after the New York World's Fair that was being held that year. So uh, that's where the world, the, 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 the title actually uh, came from. Um, the, uh, I think a key element I would say that's a, that's a thread through this is, the, you know, the cultural element. The, the group, the, the group, the Fanish groups that brought the Worldcon into, into play, the, the culture they had is very participatory primarily a literary focus, albeit with strong fan and art elements, some media, costuming, and other elements. Um, and, and the world con over the years kind of kicked off or originated most other types of genre cons. But that, that literary focus with other elements also shows up in the categories you see in the Hugos, and N Nicholas and Tammy will speak more about that. The people who attend the world con from the beginning also were a combination of fans and pros. In the first 10, 20 years, they were often the same thing, you know, fans who were aspiring pros. Uh, and, uh, you know, the average age was much younger than, say, we, we, we would be now. Um, the structure and program also, the formality of it has changed significantly. I'm holding the This, the, the little program book from the first Worldcon in 1939, and you can see we're probably not from this uh, so easily. So let me just quickly share my uh, share my screen. You can uh, you can see that the, uh, the the agenda was very much styled on a kind of like more formal uh, business type meeting. Of course, it's shifted since then, and you know what you see here would not even be a morning's worth of programming for a, a modern Worldcon. Uh, but you, you could still get a sense of the kind of things that we're talking about, a lot of content and a lot of reflections on fandom itself. Which year was this, sure. Vince? Hello? Wh which year was this? So that was 1939. Wow. So the first Worldcon, so 1939. And it's, it's been held annually ever since, apart from, I think, three or four years during the Second World War. Um, just, so just the, to, to, Vince, if I can just chuck in that Earl Korshak, who was 17 and went to that first Worldcon and briefly chaired the second Worldcon in Chicago the following year, is still alive and will yes. be at next year's Worldcon in Chicago. Indeed, he's he what, will. 96? He's 96 or 97? 
That's right, yes. Anyway, so it, it continues. <laughs> Yeah, and, and, and in fact, another example would be Ray Bradbury was a fan who attended the first Worldcon and then became a somewhat famous uh, professional writer. And he lived to 90, 100, something like that. A number of them actually did and were alive until relatively recently. But the key point is the Hugos reflect the culture of the Worldcons and that culture still, even now, is, is still largely the same. Now, if you think about the awards themselves, um, you know, each of the early world cons up the first eight or nine, you know, some of them had their, their local awards. But in, in 1951, at the ninth world con, a certificate of merit was presented to the representatives of the film The Day the Earth Stood Still, which had kind of been premiered around the time. And even I think they may have even had a screening at the world con. Uh, a, there's a famous clip by Movie to News at the time, 30 seconds. And you can actually find that still on some discs of The Day the Earth Stood Still. That kind of triggered a lot of thinking. And so two years later in 1953, the first Science Fiction Achievement Awards given by the Worldcon were given, a lot, had a nickname at the time as well, the Hugo Awards, in honor of Hugo Gernsback, one of the more prominent science fiction editors uh, for, of the pulps in the, uh, in the early part of the century. Um, in fact, the, the Hugo Award was unofficial for many, many years until 1992, when that nickname actually became the formal name of the, uh, the official name of the award. Uh, now, you know, in terms of significance, uh, the Hugos over the years have been and remain very significant, both for works and for the creators, especially novels. Many people over the years in fandom would, would, would see a, sci a science fiction or fantasy work with the title Hugo nominee or uh, winner on it. And, and that would be a sign of quality. And, and, and there's some, some research has been done to show that that's still true as well. Uh, it's certainly true that, you know, creators in the genre um, can still be very competitive uh, about, you know, getting that badge of, you know, a thank you appreciation from the community. Um, although culturally campaigning is frowned upon and action can still be taken on that, uh, especially organized uh, campaigning, such as through no award or other things. And I'm sure Tammy and uh, Nicholas will say much more about that uh, when, when we come to them. Um, the, other, the other point I would say is up until about say 12 years ago, or in fact, let me go back. In the, in the first 20, 30, 40 years of the Worldcon, it's also important to remember it wasn't a very big event. Um, if we actually look at the numbers, and this, th this is just raw data, but if we look at the actual numbers you know, of, of people who attended, up until the early 70s, it was less than a thousand. It was a few hundred, in fact. So you have to remember it was a very small, close community. Um, you know, the, if you look at the Hugo Award nominees each year, there, there were a lot of them, you know, names that kept showing up, for instance, and, and diversity, well, it was very limited, shall we say. But you can see from the numbers up until, say, the early 70s, it was, it was in the hundreds or at most a thousand. And similarly for the Hugo Awards, which were given by the attendees or the members of the Worldcon, um, you know, if, similarly, if we look, I only have the data going back to 71, but basically up until even, say, 12 years ago when we when we initiated online nomination and voting, the numbers are still around a thousand. So this, this is actually the voting ballots about a thousand and the nominations even less, about 500 um, a year. So you have to remember the relatively small number, certainly compared to the very large conventions that we have nowadays. Um, a few words just on the process. Um, it started very much as a one-step process. There were no separate nominations and voting. It's just a, a vote of all the works that were considered eligible. And of course, the number of works then were far fewer as well. You wrote down the work you liked best and whichever had the most votes, that's the one that won. It, from 1959, there was a separate nominations ballot. Um, and in fact, anybody in the community, not just Worldcon members could uh, vote. Uh, that was tightened up in 62. Um, when vote, or for 61 and 62 when voting became for members only, and then 63 nominations only. Um, and throughout the, the, the period, um, the, the, the categories, which were mainly literary and fan and, and some art at the beginning, became formalized. So since 1963, we've had the World Science Fiction Society, WUSFAS, which is at its annual meeting, determines the categories for the, uh, for the awards. Um, Again, Tammy and Nicholas will say more about that. Now, 
one thing I would say is, you know, what, what kind of award is, you know, the Hugo Award? Um, you know, it, it's voted on and nominated and voted on the members of the world on a combination of fans and pros. So it's not like the Nebula Awards given by the Science Fiction Fantasy Writers of America. That's a professional body. Um, they're more like the Oscars. It's your, the, the professional community voting on it. Although there's usually an overlap or in terms of when we look historically at what actually gets nominated because it's the Worldcon attendees are a very well-informed group. Uh, on the other hand, it's not, a, it's not a complete free People's Choice Award, like set, let's say the Dragon Awards. And it's not a juried award, like the Clark Awards. And again, Tammy and uh, Nicholas will say more about that. Uh, you know, it is very much the gift of the attendees of the Worldcon, a combination of fans and pros, as a thank you, as a, as a, as a, you know, a pat on the back for achievement across any number of categories. And it's still very much appreciated. One other thing, a very fun element of the Hugos is the actual trophy itself. Um, let me just say a few words about that. The, uh, the Hugo is famously based on a rocket, very much of the 1950s. This is an example of the standard Hugo rocket that's used every year by all world cons. This is standardized. It was based on a 1950s hood ornament, uh, which... I actually, a, a friend gifted me a cop, uh, one a few years ago. This Very was cool. actually the hood ornament for an Oldsmobile 88, and that was the inspiration for the Hugo Rocket uh, design. It changed a little bit over the years, but the one that we use nowadays was standardized by British fan Peter Weston, um, using this speaker, who was the owner of a car parts factory in England. And in fact, we still use that same factory every year to create these, uh, the, these uh, uh, the, the rocket parts. So this is the same every year. But each Worldcon committee has the right to change the base. Now, earlier, you know, the, the very early ones, 20, 30 years, they were basically just a wooden plaque with the winner name on it. But since then, the Worldcon committees have gotten more creative. And this, for instance, is the Hugo base from the Dublin Worldcon from a couple of years ago. It's actually based on uh, an ancient monument, um, which I'm sure Nicholas can say much more about since he's actually Irish. Uh, uh, from, and, uh, but, you know, this is an example of the kind of base that we can see every year. Sometimes they're practical as well like this. You know, it's a well-balanced, albeit heavy. Um, and, you know, shipping it is not that hard. Um, another example would be well, the one from, I think it's from Reno. This is separated from the, uh, the rocket, where a, a glass artist from France actually created this very beautiful base. Others sometimes are less practical. Some of them are this size, and you know, the winners don't thank you for it. But it, it's, it's a fun element of the Hugo. The rocket stays the same, and the base changes. But anyway, let, let me just summarize before handing over to uh, Nicholas. You know, the central intent of the Hugos uh, as I said, they're the gift of the Worldcon members and community. They're not a pro award as such, although they're from a highly informed group. Uh, and they do reflect the culture of the Worldcon. Um, even given the diversity limitations in the early years, the list of winners historically is a very decent representation of what's good in the genre, science fiction and fantasy. The nomination list is an excellent list and the top 15 when available is even more so. So, uh, you know, the Hugos remain very important. Um, and the fact that we've seen a number of, shall we say, campaigns only illustrates the fact of how important they're perceived to be. Anyway, I'll stop there. Let me hand back to Karen. And I hope that's given you at least a little bit of a, an inkling of the history of both the Worldcon and the Hugos, the awards that the Worldcon gives. Absolutely. That was that was wonderful, Vincent. And uh, thank you for showing us the bases also. I hadn't seen them up close before. That was, that was really cool. Um, Nicholas, did you want to... Uh, comment on what the, the base of the Dublin one was? <laughs> well, yes, I think it's it's important for people to know um, that there were a couple of elements here. One of them was that the, the, there, was a, there was an ancient monument in Ireland called Newgrange. It's a very, very large mound, and it looks a bit like that, except that it is flatter. <laughs> the, the, the spiral patterns on the stones uh, on, the, on the base are... Uh, they, they replicate the spiral patterns on the entrance stones at the gateway to the monument, which was built like 5,000 years ago, and it is still constructed in such a way that on the winter solstice, 20th of December, the light from the rising sun penetrates through to the far end of a 30-metre um, corridor. 
um, and that still works now, thousands of years later. Oh, um, wow. So it's a very it's a very special thing for Ireland, and it ties together the you know the the technological gift that people had such a very very long time ago, and of course it ties into magic and so on as well. The sculptor was a, a, a very old friend of mine called Eleanor Wheeler from Belfast, who specialises in ceramics. Amazing. Yeah, that is that is really resonant with the idea of science fiction, and I love that. Thank you. Um, I, I'm going to actually turn to Tammy next, uh, if you would li like to chat about um, how the Hugos are administered. Absolutely. And uh, if we're going to show off bases, <laughs> this is the one from, uh, from uh, New Zealand last year, which of course also has a great deal of meaning. Uh, and I don't know, Vincent, you and I would have to have a weight off here because this is heavy. <laughs> It's a solid crystal base uh, with some uh, uh, native New Zealand wood on top as well as abalone shell. And a lot of people haven't seen this yet um, because of course we didn't have an in-person Worldcon last year. So I can't wait until folks who attend the Worldcon get to see the absolute beauty that uh, John Flowers did for us last year with that base. Yeah, it is, it is beautiful. All right, so how are the Hugos administered? So this is a multi-stage process that takes, uh, you know, about a year in terms of the Hugo administration process. You know, the Hugo administrators are working behind the scenes well in advance of the Worldcon to kind of get everything ready to go and in place. Uh, so the first step, of course, um, is uh, that nominations open. That's the first thing that uh, Worldcom members see anyway. Uh, and that happens typically around January of the year of the Worldcom. And uh, members nominate what they like, right? That really is the ethos of the Worldcon. Nominate what you like. That's the ethos of the Hugos. Not what you think other people should like, but nominate what you've read and what you like. Um, and they can make up to five nominations. Uh, they are equally weighted nominations. You, your nomination doesn't count anymore if you only give one of them. Uh, and from those five nominations, we are going to select the top six as the finalists. To be a nominator, to be participating in this part of the process, you have to uh, be a member of the current Worldcon or as Vincent said, be a member of the previous year's Worldcon. So long as you joined before, I think it's December 31st. And that's because as administrators, we have some work to do to uh, consolidate the list to make sure that everybody only gets to nominate once. Uh, after a few months, usually about three months, I would say uh, the nomination period stays open. Um, and then we close that up. And then there's always this gap where everyone's very eager uh, to see who the finalists are, but uh, the administrators are hard at work uh, because, because we don't give you a list and ask you to choose your nominations, we just ask you to type them in. We have to take all of that data that all of you entered and uh, make sure that we match things up with each other. As an example, last year in the um, novella category, uh, the, uh, the, I'm blanking on the title of it right now. Nicholas, jump in and remind me of the title. This, of is, this is how you lose the time war. This is how you this lose, how the, you time lose the time war. war. This is how you Please. lose the time war. There are so many ways to write that. Right, so not only writing, this is how you lose the time war, but we also ask people to give the author names because those are, uh, uh, you know, that will help us find maybe a lesser known work. And, uh, and so this book had two authors. So once you put together the combinations of the title and the names, there were about 400-ish nominating ballots, if I remember correctly. And there had to have been at least 250 different versions of that entered into the software. So we have some great software that's been developed by fans over the years to help us do that. Um, but we go through what's called canonicalization, where we kind of make sure that when you say one thing, it means the same as something else, and both of those count towards that work. And so that's something we spend a lot of time on and a lot of attention to making sure that we get right. Uh, once those can are we all just, can we just Go ahead, Nick. Can we, just say, can we just say to Doctor Who fans, please don't write down the one with the Daleks, <laughs> because sometimes there's more than one with the Daleks, just to say. <laughs> Yeah, there's a lot of creative stuff uh, that we get to uh, be amused by. Um, but, 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 but Daleks are so important. Well, yes. <laughs> I know that, but uh, we, need, we need clarity. 
So, uh, so that happens. The other thing that happens behind the scenes during that little fa- in, in, interim period is that we reach out to the finalists and we ask them, uh, do you want to be on the ballot? Um, people do have the chance to decline and some people have for lots of different reasons over the years. Our assumption is that if you don't speak up, then you will, uh, then, then we put you on the ballot. Uh, we don't have to wait for positive confirmation uh, before putting a finalist on the ballot. Um, After all of that is done, then there is the announcements phase. And there are lots of different ways that Worldcons have done this. For several years, it was typically done at uh, Easter weekend conventions. And there was a live streamed version happening while it was happening at conventions. And that was a a, a fun thing that really, I think, helped to build interest and enthusiasm uh, within the community for the Hugo Awards. But Easter weekend, as John Scalzi pointed out, not really the greatest time to uh, announce your finalists for your major award. Uh, And with Easter bouncing around on the calendar every year, it was also a challenge um, for the schedule. So we're less tied to that now, although somebody could certainly do that again. Um, And sometimes there are videos, sometimes there are live presentations, lots of different formats. That's up to the individual world con to decide. Uh, All they have to do is kind of post a list on their website, um, but usually we like to have a little more pomp and circumstance to go along with it, really celebrate our finalists. All right, so that takes us up to the announcement and then everybody should get reading. Um, We do put out a Hugo packet most years. This is an optional thing that people can do to, um, uh, uh, optional uh, thing that Worldcons can do to provide reading materials to their, Uh, members so that they're making an educated and informed choice, right? That's what we want from people. Uh, But that takes time. Uh, We have to contact all of the uh, creators, all of the finalists and say, hey, are you willing to contribute something to the packet? We have to arrange for hosting. We have to do all of that work. And that is a very complex, lengthy process with lots of touch points. You know, we had, uh, you know, there are... uh, I was just doing the count, but I think like 19 categories, including the Hugos and the Astounding and the Lodestar, and then six finalists within each category. So there's a lot of people to be reached out to. Um, But finally, usually we'll release a packet sometime within a month or so after the announcements have been made. um, And then we'll move on to the voting phase. Somebody mentioned in the chat that the other thing Hugo administrators have to do before the finalists are ever announced is to determine eligibility. Mm-hmm. Uh, did this book come out in the year that it claimed to have come out in uh, for something like uh, the um, Astounding Award, which is for Best New Writer? Did they have any work that's before the period of eligibility that would make them ineligible for that? So there is also a process um, related to that. Um, and we'll have whole teams of people who are working on researching things and uh, helping us um, to, uh, to kind of keep track of that as we go. All right, so that takes us up to the announcement and the packet. So then when you are ready to vote, the Worldcom will have set up some form of electronic voting is the most popular way that people vote, but typically you can also vote on paper still. Um, That's shifting, but uh, typically most people are going to vote online and the voting system is a ranked choice voting system. And I know for many people uh, in other parts of the world, ranked choice voting is very familiar to them. For most Americans where I live, uh, it's a unique part of the process. Uh, for, personally, I love it. Um, but the idea here is that you rank your uh, finalists in your preferred order. Uh, And as your lower ranked finalists are eliminated, your vote, your support goes to higher ranked finalists. Uh, There's also the option to vote no award. And no award says, I don't think any of these are worth being finalists or or worth being the winner. I don't think so. um, So I don't think anything I rank underneath this should be the winner, right? So you could say none of these are good and you would rank no award one. Uh, If you want to make sure there's something that you really don't want to see win, you would rank no award above that. Uh, And very occasionally some things uh, have been won by no award, Um, but it is a way as Vincent was saying for uh, Hugo voters to make their uh, voice heard about uh, what made it onto the ballot. 
Uh, our final tallying uh, is done something uh, using something called EPH. So uh, up until 2017, I guess was the year 2017 is when we switched to using EPH. Um, it was just straight in, uh, instant runoff voting, right? So we just transferred your vote uh, as your lower ranked items got eliminated, we would um, uh, transfer your vote to your next ranked item and so on. Um, and uh, sort of keep, um, you could keep supporting things as long as they stayed in contention. So, um, so uh, what does EPH mean? What is E, P, and H? Do you, do you want me to jump in here, Tommy? Oh yeah, and actually, <laughs> and actually, uh, yeah, my notes are bad because Ben has just commented in the chat that we actually use EPH at the nomination stage, which I had totally forgotten. And we just use straight instant runoff voting for the uh, Hugo Awards. This is why I was like, this isn't making sense as I say it. Thank you for the correction there. EPH stands for E Pluribus Hugo, and it is the, um, uh, the nomination system, the nomination tallying system that was uh, created in the wake of attempts in 2015 to, let's say, mess with the Hugo nomination system through the use of slate uh, nominating, which is not really in the spirit of the award, where we want people to vote for what they individually enjoy and like. Awesome. Thank you so much, Tammy. This, I, I, I know so much, I have so much more understanding of what it means to win a Hugo now that I, I know more about the process. Like that, that is so, so helpful. Thank you. Um, I'd like to pull Nicholas in a little bit um, to tell us about how the Astounding and Lodestar became part of the ceremony. Sure. Um, the, the Astounding Award for Best New Writer is on paper relatively recent because the name was changed only last year for the first time. Uh, so when Tammy and I were running the Hugos last year, it was the astounding award for the very first time. Um, but there had been an award for best new writer named after the, the, the veteran magazine editor, John W. Campbell since 1973. That wasn't the first time it had been done. The very first Hugos in 1953 included a rather strange category for best new writer or artist. Um, it seems to be rather odd to bracket the two together. And that was won by Philip Jose Farmer, which, I, you know, that's a good call. You have to admit, he was, a, he was a good spot as a future important writer. Three years later, so for the, the, the third Hugo ceremony in 1956, they had a Hugo for best, uh, sorry, most promising new author, which was a four really four candidates, three of whom are very famous, one of them I'd never heard of, um, but uh, Robert Silverberg beat Harlan Ellison, Frank Herbert, and some other guy who I've never heard of um, for most promising new writer in 1956. And in 1959, they, they ran a Hugo special category for best new author. And on that occasion, the fans decided that none of them was promising enough and um, voted for no award. Um, there were, I think, seven or eight on the ballot, all but one of them are people I haven't heard of. But the one I have heard of was Brian Aldiss. And I must say, I think it's a bit of a miss that the Hugos didn't give him an award for Best New Writer at the beginning of his career. Um, so from 1973, Dell Magazines, which is the owner of um, the, the, the old uh, an analogue, which is, of course, still in print, was, was previously astounding, uh, magazine edited by John W. Campbell for a very long time, sponsored an award to be given alongside the Hugos to the best new writer, and it was named the John W. Campbell Award. And, um, and Campbell was a somewhat controversial figure even then. Um, I think what really changed things was two years ago, uh, three years ago now, in the run-up to the, no, two years ago still, 2019, the run-up to the Dublin ceremony, um, there had been a very good book published about Campbell, Heinlein, Asimov, and um, uh, Scientology guy, um, L. Ron Hubbard. A really good book uh, by Alec Navala Lee. And uh, basically it went into Campbell's actual beliefs and actions in such a way that it was very difficult to understand why we were still giving an award that was named after him. Uh, the recipient of the award that year, Jeanette Ng, made a, a pretty impassioned speech 
um, very briefly, uh, but very succinctly, um, outlining the problems with, uh, with, with, with having an award named after somebody like him. Um, and the arguments were cogent and compelling. And um, within, within a couple of weeks, Dell magazines announced that they were renaming the award to the Astounding Award, celebrating the magazine rather than its editor. Uh, so Tammy and I last year uh, had the responsibility of administering the Astounding Award for the first time, though it's basically the same as the John W. Campbell Award that had been awarded since 1973, and the plaque is still the same. Last year, by the way, because the, um, the award ceremony was virtual rather than in person, I slightly hoped that Dell magazines might be able to deliver the, the, the plaque to the winner in person and get photographs. Uh, but unfortunately, she lived just too far out of reach from New York for that to be possible, and it was shipped to her by surface mail. The Lodestar Award is quite a different thing. The Lodestar Award is part of the World Science Fiction Society constitution, so it's in with the Hugos, but it's not a Hugo, and the reason for that is that nothing can be eligible for two Hugos in the same year, and we wanted to maintain the option that awards for the best writing for young adults um, could also be treated as simply best writing. Um, you know, writing that is aimed at the young adult market has won the Hugo Award previously. I think Neil Gaiman's The Graveyard Book is the most obvious example recently that comes to my mind. Um, th this ties into a, a bigger thing, which is that the number of Hugo Awards has been gradually increasing over the years. 20 years how, ago. How many is it now? Well, now it is, um, it's uh, 17 actual Hugo, sorry, there's 18 actual Hugo categories on the ballot, plus the astounding award, plus the Lodestar award. That's 17 that are in the constitution. And then every year the World Con is allowed to run a new category if there is sufficient reason for it. And this year, um, this year's World Con has decided to run the a category for best video game. I'm kind of hesitating with the first person pronoun here because I, I'm now the director of the Wisps division for Discom, but I wasn't at the time that decision was made. But it was a good decision and I support it and I'm happy to implement it. Um, so, in other words, there's an overall process of gradually, I, nobody ever wants to delete a Hugo category. Um, the uh, We've, we've had, for instance, the split of best dramatic presentation into longer form and shorter form, longer form being films and entire TV series. Last year, it was won by the Good Omens series from BBC. And we've had splits of best editor um, into editors who edit books and editors who edit um, uh, who edit magazines. Yeah, I, mean, I see Ben Yallow commenting that uh, occasionally they do get deleted, but it's really, I, I have to say that the the direction of travel is rather clear and it's not downwards. Um, so the Lodestar came out of that and it also came out of activism within the community of people who felt that um, the young adult subgenre or genre needed extra recognition. And also for that reason, we, have a, we now also have an award for best series, um, which goes to you know, books with more than... Uh, I'm sorry, I just heard a loud shout from outside because I'm sitting in Belgium and I think we just scored against Russia. Um, so I get distracted occasionally. Um, so the best series is a relatively new Hugo category. I actually trialled it my first year as a Hugo administrator in Finland in 2017. Um, I approve of the winners so far. We'll see, we'll see how, how long it lasts. Um, this is a dynamic process and it's a process that is owned by Worldcon. Um, and uh, there, there is fierce debate, and I have put forward my own proposals, and mostly they don't succeed. Um, you know, the, it's a, it's a, the, the personality of the Hugos is to a certain extent determined by the voters, but also to a certain extent by those who revise the constitution, and by those so, who so have the to, to be clear about that, um, those changes are made by WizFizz, and and. What is and how is WizFizz structured to make those yeah. changes? Every Worldcon member of the relevant year is a WizFizz member. And every Worldcon includes a business meeting of WizFizz at which constitutional amendments, which mainly tend to be to do with Hugo Awards, can be submitted, debated and ratified. 
an amendment must be ratified two years running uh, to actually be implemented. Um, so there is a there is a sort of process for thinking again if it turns out to be a silly idea. Um, uh, and yeah, I mean the business meeting itself takes up several mornings of the world con. So I must say uh, I I very much uh, admire those who have the stamina to stand up to that sort of cruel and unusual punishment. So so what you're saying is it takes a lot of work. <laughs> it takes a lot of energy. Uh, work I'm not sure, but energy certainly. Some of us like really that sort of thing, Nicholas. So I know, I know. Part of my, my favorite part of some world cons is hanging out with people in the business meeting, but, uh, but I get it. It is, it is a, it's a time investment. Yeah, to, <laughs> yeah. to Alan's question, though, just, just to be clear, I mean, the, the world con itself and the members of the world con are the, uh, are the important body, if you like, that WUSFIS, the World's Science Fiction Society, by definition is an unincorporated literary society, which only exists really to, to, to help bring order to the rules for the world con. You know, the, the, you, you, could, you could argue that WUSFIS, and you could certainly argue the Hugos are the, the kind of like the tail that often wags the world con um, dog, but, you know, the, the world con is basically a, you know, Albeit imperfect democratic organization, and whoever the members, the attend, the you know the, the, the people who have chosen to participate uh, each year, they get to choose the rules. And WUSFIS is just a construction to allow us to bring order to that. Um, so you know th th that that kind of slightly anarchic, hopefully democratic, very opinionated. Uh, mm -hmm. and, 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 and although there's, there tends to be a core of people, maybe a third of the attendees, 1,000, 2,000, who are pretty much go to all world cons and probably have a strong influence on the Hugo nomination and, uh, and the rules. Nevertheless, everyone who is a member uh, each year has the chance not only to participate in the Hugo process, but also to amend the rules. And WUSFIS is so, just a structure awesome. to, to, to help f with that. So anybody can make those changes if they put in the time and the work. Absolutely, it's it's absolutely. not like some arcane uh, group that's making all of these decisions. And technically, you need two people to make a proposal, so not just one person, but yeah. I mean, yeah. fundamentally, yeah. And then you have to persuade everyone else that your idea is a good one, that's right? So that's, that's key to the process. Um, I actually have one more one more question for Nicholas, which is um, if you could comment. So thank you for telling us about the astounding and the lodestar a bit. Uh, if you could also comment on sort of situating the Nebula and the Hugo Awards and how those differ. And, and other mean, awards. And, uh, yes. And, yeah. I mean, Vince covered this a little bit already. Uh, um, you know, awards are fundamentally fun and lots of people like receiving them and lots of people like giving them out. And personally, I'm very invested in both the, the British Science Fiction Award, which is given out at the British Easter Call. Um, and the Arthur C. Clarke Award, which is a juried award, and I had the honour to be one of the jurors myself in 2015. Um, but the Nebula Awards are probably the, the, the most prominent after the Hugos, and they're the ones that are given by the, the authors, the science fiction writers of science fiction and fantasy writers of America. Um, and those just came out the other day. Uh, and usually there's a certain amount of overlap with the Hugos. Generally, it's not complete. I was just checking the last few years, one Nebula winner also won a Hugo and otherwise the results varied. If you go back to um, the 1971 Hugos and the 1970 Nebulas, Nebulas are awarded for the year before, as it were, um, there, that was a case where all three fiction categories went to the same three um, literary works to Ringworld by Larry Niven, which you know, flawed though it is, it's certainly a classic. Um, Slow Sculpture, a story by Theodore Sturgeon, which really hasn't aged well, I'm sorry to say. I went back into, and looked at it a couple of years ago. Um, and the Fritz, uh, Fritz Leiber story, Il Met in Lankmar, which um, is, is rollicking fun, but certainly speaks to a past age rather than to the 1970s, um, which we were just entering. So, uh, that, but that's the only occasion when the, there's been a complete overlap. And as I say, since then, it's been you tend to see similar things, but not the same things popping up on the on the final ballots. Um, we've had more recent things. You know, the, the Locus Awards are an open ballot run by Locus magazine, 
um, so you know that that really is a popularity snapshot. The difference with the Hugos is that there's a certain amount of investment, and in that you have to have actually bought a Worldcom membership before you get to vote. Whereas with Locus Awards, you anybody can vote. Um, and we're seeing um, similar initiatives. The the DragonCon Awards. Um, they don't publish the actual voting figures, but I understand that the the numbers voting are of the similar order of magnitude to the Hugos, so, you know, uh, in, in into four figures. Um, we had the Firecon Awards last year as well, which I think are um, are going to be an interesting, you know, if they decide to continue, it was, uh, the first time they did it, and who knows, they may choose to do something else in the future. Um, you should choose how to invest your time. The, the, the other ones that I follow uh, quite closely are what, what used to be called the, the Tiptree Awards, uh, named after James Tiptree Jr., and are now being called the Otherwise Award, if I remember correctly. Um, and the, this is for work in science fiction that is particularly interesting from the gender perspective. Um, and you have the Prometheus Society Awards with their, uh, sorry, the Prometheus Society gives its Libertarian Awards. There's the Alternate Histories with the Sidewise Awards, if that's what happens to tick your boxes there's a lot of them out there and um a lot of uh, a lot of people have a have a right to be happy at the end of every year when when the when these things come through but the yugos remain the senior and longest lasting of all of these um awards and i think for that reason they are the ones that will tend to generate the most media coverage and the most interest um from wider fandom Th thanks. Um, so, uh, in terms of that, that that more focus and 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 from broader fandom and and the media, uh, do you think that that will continue as these other awards get uh, more uh, years under their belts and uh, become more well known? I mean, you know, the Hugo's will still be the oldest awards. I mean, they, that, that's not going to be taken away from them, and they will still be the. I think the, the the largest mass participation vote and they're tied to the World Science Fiction Convention, which, I mean, we have to be honest, the world is a rather uh, restricted portion of the world in, in Worldcon, but nonetheless, it's the, it's the sort of um, senior event of, of the year, lead, leading event of the year is probably a better way to put it, although it's getting increasingly senior as well as we all get older. Um, so... Yeah, I think the Hugos are pretty stable. Um, there was a, a rocky moment in 2015, 2016, when there was an organised attempt to take over the, the process, but um, you know, the fandom resisted. Uh, fandom did not like the process being messed with in that way. Um, so I, I'm reminded by one of my colleagues in this year's Worldcon that... Um, the business meeting for this year is very much open for business and um, Linda Denner off the chair is very happy to receive and to to receive proposals and to assist with drafting them. And, and Alan, I'll just want to comment on your question about, you know, will the Hugos maintain their prominence? I think they will, right? Nobody can catch up in terms of age. Um, but I think that these other awards that we're seeing um, provide just a broader view, right? Um, Nicholas said this earlier, depending what you're interested in, depending where your focus is, um, there are all sorts of awards out there. And um, to the extent these are reading lists and these are uh, in, informing us about what matters um, and where the impactful works are being created, looking across the spread of awards of which the Hugo is one part uh, is, is key. One of my favorite books from 2019 was on the nebula nebula ballot and didn't make the Hugo ballot that year. Yeah. Um, so uh, you know, being able to look across, uh, I think, is really helpful. I, I must so, say, so, as, an, as an administrator, quite often I'm looking at the ballot and thinking, what are the voters thinking? I mean, <laughs> last, last year, I voted for one of the winners in the twenty categories. And if you if you if you're watching and you're wondering if it was you, uh, yes, it was. <laughs> <laughs> um. Oh, looking at uh, Vincent's graphs from earlier, there was that great increase in nominating and voting starting in the late 70s, right? How has that changed um, the works that are being nominated and voted on? You, Vincent's going to correct me on the date. The, the, there are two inflection points. Actually, the, the, the one that you're referring to was the, the size of the Worldcon itself. 
Um, and almost certainly that was a combination of factors, but undoubtedly the, you know, the, the, there were demographic effects, you know, the baby boomers, there was, uh, there was st uh, Star Trek, Star Wars, the beginnings of science fiction, which previously had been very much a, a niche and, a, you know, and looked down upon becoming more into the mainstream. The actual numbers for the Hugos are much more recent than that, even up until, say, 2005, 2008. The numbers of nominators was still roughly around 500, and the number of voters around 1,000. And this is when world cons were multiple thousands. Um, and, um, you know, and that was partly triggered by, I'm sure, by online voting and everything uh, as well. But the, number, the thing you're referring to is the size of the world con itself, and, and, and there were a number of factors for that. And I think to pick up on Nicholas's point as well, um, there, there has been a long period, partly driven by the fact that a lot of the organizers of Worldcon come from that period, the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, and we are now getting on a bit. But we are seeing the change. You know, if you go back over the history of Worldcon, there have been waves of change. And then inevitably, like any organization that's culturally based, it will be conservative with a small C and there will be resistance to that change. But in the last 10 years, we have seen a massive change there. We're beginning to see that change organizationally. That creates lots of noise. The, the attempt to game the system in 2015 was partly a reaction to that as well, which fortunately was defeated. If you look at the diversity of the ballot, if you look at the diversity of the guests, if you look at the diversity of the people running it, albeit it's still very much a English language or Anglophone based, but it's still getting wider. It's all changing and it's all changing quickly. And for me, that's the sign that actually, to answer the other question, both the Hugos and the Worldcon are likely to continue for quite some time. And one would hope until 2039, at least, the, uh, the, the, the 100th anniversary, what, you, what US people would call the centennial or in the UK, the centenary. Uh, and one, I would, one would even hope to live that long to, uh, to attend it. I, I think Vincent made a good point there um, that the rise in nominations, the rise in voting, I mean, I think those are really great signs, both for the health of the Worldcon and the health of the awards. And, and I think we see those reflected um, in, the, in, in who's winning. And as Vincent said, I mean, we've seen this massive uh, increase in the diversity. And I think we are really recognizing with the Hugo Awards, the amazing diversity um, of, uh, of the a creator population in our, you know, the creator parts of our of our community. Um, and so by involving more people, by expanding that pool, by getting more people engaged, we're starting to recognize different kinds of works, which I think is fantastic. I, I have a slightly heretical viewpoint on this. I think there, there are two reasons we haven't mentioned for the two shifts that, that, that took place. I think, first of all, Vincent is absolutely right that the number of people attending Worldcons hugely rose at the end of the 1970s. And I think the answer in two words is Star Wars. Uh, I think that essentially made um, science fiction fandom respectable and mainstream in a way that it possibly had not been before then. And that was a massive boost to the number of people in the system. The second thing is the, the, num the boost in the number of people voting, which was really around 2010, 2011, that it was steadily over 2000. Um, a lot of people don't remember this, but back in 2007, of the 20 um, finalists in the four fiction ballot categories, 19 were men. And I think that was a bit of a wake-up call for a lot of us who like the Hugos and thinking, how is this happening? How are we allowing the awards to fail to be representative of the field in that way? And you know, to say that there was a that there was a plan would be putting it too uh, too strongly, but I think there was an, there was definitely an enhanced awareness and activism from that point on, um, and we're seeing that playing through in the in the nature of the work that gets gets nominated. I have to say, I think also that the short fiction that we're getting nominated now is a lot better than it was fifteen years ago. Yeah, there really was that concerted effort to raise the profile of the awards, yeah. doing those, um, you know, simulcasts at multiple science fiction conventions for the announcements. That was part of getting more people who are already in the community to care about the awards instead of just a small subset of people who attend Worldcon. Let's get all the Worldcon members to care and let's get people to become Worldcon members because they care about the Hugo Awards. Yeah, and as, uh, I'm sure it's, an, it's one of these things. It's an and and and. There were yeah. multiple of things going on. The, the shift to online nomination and voting was surely helpful. The creation of the Hugo packets, 
uh, of all of you know as many of the works nominated as possible surely has had an effect. The, also, the move of a lot of the work itself online. I mean, it's very noticeable. You, you and Nicholas will can say more, but you know, in the last several years, the, the shift is very noticeable from the traditional paper magazines, the As Asimov, Analog, etc., to the online fiction uh, magazines mm. as well. So, it, you know, it, it, none of these is black and white. None of these is probably the the biggest factor. It's a combination of all of these things, and it has resulted in a much more diverse a much more lively process, certainly a much noisier process, uh, but that's probably not a bad thing. It's a healthy process, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, we should thank John Scalzi for having you know, started the, the uh, Hugo Packet in its current form. Um, and I, I, the, the online element matters a bit less than you would think, Vince, because I remember you know, 15, 17 years ago, pretty much all of the finalist stories were already online even before the ballot was announced. And uh, if anything, they're a bit more difficult to get now because some of them are, pay are payment only. Um, yeah. But the, the but, uh, but you're, but you're right. substituted for that. But the, the fact that the, the process yes. is online yeah. has surely, and, and has also helped. I mean, previously it was hugely US dominated. I mean, it's still US dominated, but it has become much more widely spread across, you know, across geographies, certainly across Anglophone geographies. Yeah. And, and you know, the idea of campaigning for Hugo Awards is uh, a controversial one with lots of different perspectives. But the fact that authors do put up their lists of here's what I published this year that's eligible, that's all helped to um, raise the profile of the Hugo Awards in general. And, and that's something brought to us by social media and the Internet yeah. and just the passage of time. So in, in, in you were talking earlier about how uh, the categories change over time. And I know that this year for, for Disc on 3, there is the, the video game category. Um, do you think that there are any new categories that are likely to pop up over the next uh, five to 10 years? And if so, what would you imagine might show up? With my administrator's hat on, I really hope not. I think we've got enough already. And so the ceremony is quite long enough. Having said that, a lot of things are being are being discussed. Um, there's uh, some, some quite some quite vehement voices are pushing the idea of having a Hugo for best translated work. I don't think it makes sense myself. I don't think um, Hugo voters are well placed to make that sort of judgment. Um, but I'm also aware that the business meeting doesn't always agree with me. Um, so maybe we'll get something like that uh, popping up. Um, I, I think we're also seeing in the best related work category, which for years had been a sort of resting place for academic monographs and autobiographies and studious stuff about science fiction. Um, the last two years have seen two very non-standard winners in that um, two years ago in Dublin, it was the archive of our own website. And then last year, it was Jeanette Ng's speech, which I mentioned earlier, which she'd made in Dublin the year before, which itself then won the best related work Hugo um, in the 2020 Hugos. And this year, there are only two books on the ballot of, of six uh, finalists. Um, so, you know, that's clearly something that is shifting. And I, I would have more sympathy personally with those who want to kind of create a ring fenced category for, for best nonfiction writing about science fiction. And, and as, as you know, I would always wave the flag for arts and illustrated mm -hmm. books as well, which traditionally, certainly up until 10 years ago, were also very, very uh, important. And, and, I, and I would note that arts remains, and especially visual arts, remains very important to the community. The, 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 the guest of honour of the first World Con in 1939 was an artist, not a writer. And art remains very, very important. But, you know, as, as Nicholas said, ultimately, it's it, it's the, the consensus of those who participate in the rulemaking that, that results in the categories we have. Having said that, there is continuous refinement of those. And there, there, there is a certain resistance to what's called the, you know, in, inflation of Hugo categories. As, as Tammy referred to earlier, the burden on the administrators is significant, but the burden on the people voting as well of oh, this just massive work. You know, the, the cliche is that, you know, in the 50s or 60s, one individual could encompass everything produced in science fiction and fantasy. Uh, that That is long gone. Uh, just think of all the streaming services. Just think of all the fiction works that are produced. Um, but nevertheless, the principle, the philosophical principle is, you know, it's, it, the 
everybody nominating for uh, for the Hugos, it's not about what is the absolute best. It's what we as a participatory community, a well-informed one, want to award, to reward. And that's either for works or that's for indiv- or, or for people, you know, so for works or for participation. And, uh, and that's, that philosophy still remains. Uh, and so refinements will continue. But I suspect there, there may well be a resistance to add too many more. Nevertheless, some refinements may still take place. Maybe related will get some refinements. Maybe some of the others where, you know, Nicholas mentioned the best series uh, earlier, which is one of the newer ones. You know, the, the, the categories that we have uh, deleted over the years have tended to be ones where after a number of years as a realization, maybe it's not working the way we thought it would originally. It doesn't happen very often, but nevertheless, it can happen. So it will be interesting to see with the categories over the next several years. Oh, one of the last things I wanted to ask about is um, the fan categories, um, which is something that is relatively unique about the Hugos. Um, can you explain to me uh, exactly what 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 caused the fan categories as opposed to the professional categories and why why they exist? Well, it's been an element of the Hugos from the very beginning, and yeah. um, you know, there, there's there's always been uh, uh, an award for fan activity because it's the award of the Worldcon, which is a convention of fans. And Vince, you you um, you have actually won one, I think. If I'm right, I was nominated for one. I haven't won one, but uh, uh, right, okay. <laughs> uh, but but yeah, Nicholas is exactly right. I mean, and that goes back to this point: the Worldcon membership is a combination of fans and pros, or and or in fact, many many who are the same. Many many professionals would would consider themselves also fans, and 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 we have retained that from the very beginning for both people and for works. So even now, for, um, in the categories, we still have. You know, best fanzine, fan magazine, um, uh, best fan artist, best fan writer. Um, we added fan cast, which is basically like the you know the audio, um, um, well, audio and video uh, Pod- podcasts, podcasts, basically. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Okay, yeah, basically, yes. Um, and then a number of related, you know, the, 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 what's called semi prosine a, a very, very strange term for anyone who's not been part of the process, semi-professional <laughs> magazine, because there are a number of kind of like intermediate works or, or magazines, if you like, or online magazines nowadays, um, which, is, which is a very typical element of science fiction fandom, because you have that transition from um, amateur through semi-professional to professional and we've retained that since the very beginning now the um uh you know some some years maybe it drops out some some years it comes back but the fact of having the fan categories remains very deliberately part of it because the the kind of thank you the encouragement we want to give by by nominating people for the or works for the uh, the hugos is part of that community feedback and yeah. and for and, and part of that as a community is you know Amateur fan activity is important, and we do want to reward it. Amazing! Thank you so much. Um, I think we'll we're nearing the end of our time, so we'll, we'll wrap up there. But thank you. Uh, I, I've learned so much more than than I knew about uh, all of these awards, and it'll be you know really interesting as we go through the seasons of these awards this year, just to have that extra context. Uh, Vincent, Tammy, Nicholas, thank you so much. Um, if you enjoyed the show, uh, you can subscribe on our website, uh, essenceofwonder.com, for more content. Uh, please don't forget to like us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Twitch. We're, we're on all of those. And over the uh, upcoming few months, we will have a series of shows with the finalists for this year's awards. Uh, the next show will be highlighting the best novel and astounding award finalists with a couple interviews on the 26th of June at 3 p.m. Eastern time. And this was Essence of Wonder. We hope you have an excellent week and uh, hope to see you soon.